Good evening, listeners, brave navigators of the enigmatic and the concealed. Have you ever felt the pull of the unanswered, the allure of the mysteries that shroud our existence? For more than a decade, a unique comic publisher has dared to dive into these mysteries, unafraid of the secrets they might uncover. This audacious entity is Paranoid American. Welcome to the mystifying universe of the Paranoid American podcast. Launched in the year 2012, Paranoid American has been on a mission to decipher the encrypted secrets of our world. From the unnerving enigma of MK Ultra mind control to the clandestine assemblies of secret societies. From the awe-inspiring frontiers of forbidden technology to the arcane patterns of occult symbols in our very own pop culture. They have committed to unveiling the concealed realities that lie just beneath the surface. Join us as we navigate these intricate landscapes, decoding the hidden scripts of our society and challenging the accepted perceptions of reality. Folks, I've got a big problem on my hands. There's a company called Paranoid American making all these funny memes and comics. Now I'm a fair guy. I believe in free speech uh, as long as it doesn't cross the line. And if these AI-generated memes dare to make fun of me, they're crossing the line. This is your expedition into the realm of the extraordinary, the secret, the shrouded. Come with us as we sift through the world's grand mysteries, question the standardized narratives, and brave the cryptic labyrinth of the concealed truth. So strap yourselves in, broaden your horizons, and steel yourselves for a voyage into the enigmatic heart of the paranoid American podcast. Where each story, every image, every revelation brings us one step closer to the elusive truth. Another episode of Paranoid American Podcast. And uh, for anyone that's not listening, it's actually watching this video. Let me know, should I have the green light on or off? Donut was telling me to turn the light off and it looked better. Um, I'll, I'll do a, a, that one a different time, but we've got someone way more important than what the hell the background color is. That's Ryan uh, Christian from The Last American Vagabond. And let me just throw you up here with me right off the bat. My good sir, my friend, I met you on the Reality Czars podcast, and I just want to do plug up front and let you, you know, kind of shout out where people can find you, what the website is, what you do in general, and then we'll get into the details. Okay. Yeah. And I enjoyed that conversation we had on that last episode of Reality Czars. It was a good, interesting, multifaceted conversation, which I, which I always love. Now, <clears throat> the last American Vagabond.com is the best place for you guys to support all the work that comes out of our platform. That's the kind of the hub in general, but uh, you know, there's a lot of different other ways to support our platform. What we do in general is just kind of covering anything that I think and that the team thinks is important that you're being lied to about. And when that really started in general for me was, you know, highlighted, it really focused on cannabis law reform. When I first started this, not ever knowing it was going to go where it is today and just broadened out because of that topic, as anyone that's looked into it really knows it's much bigger than just about cannabis. And it really opened my mind to how things are politically manipulated and controlled. And from there over, you know, a decade plus, it's really broadened out into just really anything. And I've, I've, I've over like probably last five years strong, really had a deep focus on foreign policy because right away I couldn't remove my mind. You know, the, the war on drugs very clearly became this foreign policy overlap and just, you know, the rabbit hole explodes from there. And, and, you know, so right now it's just, it's obviously with Israel and Gaza, you know, there's so much going on that it interestingly ties back to so many domestic things but really just this kind of anything, really. I mean, I, I'm, I've never shied away from even things that people would consider like the most crazy conspiracy theory. I even did a show a long time ago. I forgot, I think I called it um, the flat earth theory, uh, an exercise in keeping an open mind, right? I did it for a reason because I didn't think it was a, that there was, you know, uh, there was truth to the core value of that conversation. And I, but I nonetheless was like, but you know, we should never just refuse to do our due diligence. We should go through it, but not going into it going, oh, here we go. Cause then you're going to find what you lot, what you're looking for. And I went through it and I found some pretty alar strange things, like things that I don't think are explained, but I still feel like I didn't come to the conclusion that that means, you know, the flat earth and so on. My point though, is that that's, it's important not to be afraid of those things, you know, which is why I love what you do and what you guys are doing on these different shows. It's important to not be afraid, just scared of the word conspiracy theory, you know, it's so frustrating. I like that you already opened the door to uh, flat Earth and drug war and all kinds. Of, so actually, since we this week was three two two, and there was like a big, it's almost like a like a party in the conspiracy community. It's like a four twenty for conspiracy to just talk about skull and bones and talk about 
Gamachi and stuff. Um, I got. I guess I have this running theory, and I feel like I would trust your word a little bit more than mine as an appeal to authority, which is the best fallacy if you have to do one. And I kind of think that my whole background of research kind of leads to like this aristocracy that way back when even it was illegal in China, but they were sneaking into China through like the Dutch um, and the Indian trade companies, right? And bringing mm-hmm. opium over. <clears throat> and it seems like all that money ends up funding academia in general, like through Rockefellers, through Jekyll Island, but in, you know, in particular through like Yale is the big one where that skull and bones connection is, is how much of this in your opinion is just like wildly connecting strings and like an effort to just have a cohesive narrative versus yes, like the, op- the illegal opium trade did found, you know, the academics in the United States. Is that like a true statement? Well, I mean, I would say it's not as simple as that. I would say it's an undeniable reality that you can clearly draw those parallels, the connections, right? And the question is, is that the only thing or is it as simple as saying that is that, and like to your first question that is, you know, is there truth? And well, obviously, and I, I just don't, I, I would argue that there's a lot of black market and, you know, especially to today when you get into like intelligence and drug trafficking and human trafficking and how these things are literally the blood that, you know, this is how it is how they conduct their black ops around the world that we don't really know about using this money. And it's the same thing as far back as you want to look. There's always been power structures that will always abuse circumstances. And like, like a good example with even using opium as a point with Afghanistan and the opium crisis or rather opioid crisis. You know, these things connect as far back as you want to look. The question is, is that the only thing that was going on? Does that then delegitimize all the different overlaps? And, you know, it's never all in one. And I think that's the thing with, with a lot of the, the mindset of certain, you know, I look the word conspiracy theory is a ridiculous thing in the first place, right? It's a, it's a legitimate concept. And like in the, in the way it's used, right? It is a legitimate word. There is conspiracy. It's a legal charge. And our, the people get charged with conspiracy in this country. So the fact that we ever like a, a, a lot, this weird, you know, c- conspiracy is a fake thing. It's like, well, then why are people going to jail for conspiracy in the, in the financial world? You know, it's ridiculous. Then you theorize about people who conspire. Like why that ever be? I mean, that's just a benign thing. That's like saying investigating news. <laughs> it's, it's the same exact thing. It's just because it became this kind of catch-all for don't look into the power, right? That's really all it really meant because that means you're crazy, you know? And so the point is, what I said that for is because, you know, whether it's the people that would go down to the depths of what they would call conspiracy theory, where they're just randomly connecting things to make their narrative make sense, or, you know, I I don't, I think that is a a problem because people will be subjective about the way they connect things, but that doesn't delegitimize the point that you made, that there's obvious, the, the, the illegal trades, like even going back to like things of like, I mean, any piracy or any kind of avenue where these things were happening, like the East Indian trade, you can show that these fine, the money was being used by the same power structure in many ways that were fighting these things, you know, and this goes back as far as you want to look. So, I mean, again, my answer would be that there's no way to say for sure. I'm giving you my opinion about historical connections, but I think it's really stupid to pretend like those things aren't just obvious, right? Like academia is a good next place to your question does that then mean that there's never been any valid research? Well, no. I mean, you can show that there's been things that have been done right, but I think what it really comes down to at the crux of how it affects us in this moment is that you can clearly show that money, ill-gotten gain, is used and always has been and is today to manipulate things that we perceive as being kind of above the fold, you know, like white coat labs and, you know, doctors and academia. Well, these people are people, they lie and they take money and they, they could be wrong, you know? So I think that's a very obvious reality. You can show even taking it to a, a whoops, I'm still getting used to this mic placement, actually, if you can tell. The, yeah, because I used to have this one up here. But the, uh, the, you could take it to like the Flexner report, right? And the Rockefeller medicine conversation and how that is a, like a, not new, but like way past the opium conversation to our lifetime, how they use this uh, this argument, right? They manipulated us into the idea of pharmaceutical oil-based, petroleum-based medicine away from, you know, homeopathy, which by the way, Rockefeller used a homeopathy, home, uh, homeopath until the day he died, even though he jammed us all into his oil-based, you know, and it's the same exact concept in, in a, you know, way using something that were perceived to be legitimate to drive us into something that we just take at face value as being positive, you know, that that's academia in my mindset in general. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it serves a purpose, but uh, there's a famous um, point, uh, uh, it's a clip that I play all the time where the guy goes, look, like academia is about, you know, there's research, it's important, but the, the real science, that's done in the field. 
right? Not, not academia is about consensus. Well, consensus has a place, but real science, that's always historically been boxed out. You're the trailblazer. You're the one that's outside the consensus. You break the mold and it takes 20 years for these old people over here to go, well, I've been wrong the whole time, you know, and they, they push back on it, but always, you know, throughout time that happens, you know, anyway, I'm trailing from point to point, but there's so much mm -hmm. interesting history around that, you know, where you can see just this dishonesty as far back as you can look. Your point about being in the field versus being in academia exclusively, I, I always butcher this one uh, anecdote and it's like a super long one. So the short version, I think it was like Francis Bacon, but that mm -hmm. there's like a room full of doctors and they're arguing over how, how many teeth are in a horse's mouth and they spend like 20 hours on it. And like, they finally kind of come to a consensus of left off the argument. And then like the dude delivering, you know, the, the Starbucks or whatever the hell it is back in the day. Uh, he shows up and he's just like, why don't you guys just count? You know what I mean? Because the horse is like right there. And he's right. like, why don't you just count them the teeth? And they're all like, this idiot. <laughs> you know what I mean? This guy thinks that he's going to figure this out. Yeah. Like, look at that. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, and, but, uh, you made a, a statement in there about Rockefeller medicine. And I feel like that one is a good example because Rockefeller medicine, in my mind, doesn't exist without the academic system to give you the degrees and give you all of the trials and the certifications mm. so that you can say this is a thing, right? As as simplistic as it is, do you think Rockefeller medicine as that concept is net positive or net negative in any way? Oh, 100% negative. Well, I mean, it, look, it, it comes down to the intent as always. Now, I would actually say from a core value, in my opinion, I think the entire thing is based on in, you know an illusion to a degree, like that it's not necessarily the best direction for any medical concept, but it had there, you know, you could like, for instance, you could take something like antidepressants, which I think should be pretty much never used ever anywhere, in my opinion. But I, you can, like, I would argue that you could probably show an extreme case that where, you know, somebody's like literally, for, you know, whatever we would call that most extreme, like borderline, so maybe even, you know, suicidal without any other medications happening. And that maybe that, you know, might make a difference. And there's studies that argue that might make a case. And I'm only saying that to be objective because I'm not the scientist and I've never done these in-depth, you know, we could, the caveat could be that those scientists were paid off by the companies making the drugs. You know, we know this stuff, but without, with that caveat that it might help some people in extreme cases, I think the evidence is wildly clear. Again, just on antidepressants for this point, you can show that they cause suicidal thoughts. You can show that this causes people to spiral in a negative way. And then even trying to get off of them, it's like the, it's the literally like, I, I've read that this is worse than even opioids or even like the, weaning off of antidepressants is near deadly for some people. You know, it's just like, well, what the fuck are we even taking these for? Like, there's such a clear net negative on this. And so then the point is you broaden it out. And by the way, if you haven't seen this for your audience, there's been studies a long time ago, as we all seem how this, how this goes, where the study comes out showing you fluoride is bad and they just could ignore it. Right. But that they've done studies recently, big studies that come out. I think two of them showing you that it's just antidepressants do not work. And guess what? Nothing happened. They're still using them. They're still mass prescribed. They're still the go-to for doctors. How the fuck does that make sense? Right. There's, there's, there's your disconnect, but in the whole field of it all, you know, met pharmaceutical medicine, which is where I would kind of call Rockefeller medicine, <clears throat> There's other directions you could take that, but specifically the petroleum based medicine, it's, it is, it's not logical. Like you can, you can look into this and realize that they're like, let's just say you take one to one and you look at things like, you know, cannabis, for example, or any other thing, because people have this weird thing about cannabis. There's natural versions of medicine that are and I, provably so peer reviewed science proving that these things have better effects, less negative side effects. And even if you want to argue that you say a study finds, let's say, a stronger effect in the positive direction, that you can weigh that against all of the negative side effects. You know, here's 14 other medications to counteract all the side effects because you had that one positive thing. It's a net negative to your point. I think that's a provable thing. It's things like statins, for example, that we've used for how long? And it's been known at the highest level of medicine that these things are bad, like just don't work, cause so much more negative. I mean, again, you could call maybe the high peak, worst situation, there's a positive effect, but by and large, Dr. Uh, Maholtra spoke about this. They are bad, man. They're killing people and we still use them, you know? So I think it goes back to that core point about that this is not just about being misinformed. There's a structural, like inherent systemic problem with this at the highest level that somehow turns its eye to these problems. Derek Rose has been breaking down the fluoride trial. You know, that's as clear as you could ever get one of these situations. All the evidence is there. All that they're debating is like whether we let this become public and like they're debating whether it even shows what it does. And it's been done for four years. Fluoride is hurting people. They don't care. Your EPA right now is literally fighting to keep something that's dangerous in your water. That's what they're doing. It's, it's just mind blowing.
And not to mention that fluoride is a byproduct of the petroleum industry. So it's, it's kind of <laughs> exactly. convenient that what normally would have been a waste product ends up being this miraculous thing that saves baby teeth. And, well, the best, and I just the best want way to put it is that we have to pay for it. We'd otherwise be, they'd have to pay <laughs> right. to dispose of it, but we pay to put it in our water. It's like, talk about a double, double whatever you call that, a catcher. What'd you call that? Eat your cake, getting, eat, getting your cake and eating too. I don't know. One of those analogies. <laughs> what do you, um, what do you think about the whole like fluoride calcifying the pineal gland theories? Do you think that that's legit? Uh huh. Totally. I mean, there's science around this. Like th these are, these are the, the, you know, the kind of science that gets done that gets, you know, never truly peer reviewed. Like they just kind of gets rested as a preprint and nobody ever touches it. So they just disregard it, you know, but there's plenty of science around this. You do have a pineal gland. It's not, it's here. That's one of those funny things. It's like how we never get taught about the federal reserve. Why did that ever make sense? It's obvious why, right? You never get taught about the pineal gland in school. Why? It's a real thing. Well, all guys have a that. pineal gland, right? It's just, it's only girls that don't have one. No, I, as far as I understand it, that everybody has a pineal gland, unless that's something I never heard before. I don't know why no only... I, I well, think 2024, I, maybe, I guess. Anyone that wants a pineal gland can have one, I guess. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I mean, I'm not even trying to make some kind of weird trans point. I'm saying legitimately, as I understand it, I think everybody does. If you're right, that's crazy. I've never heard that before. But that's not like I'm an expert on pineal glands, but I'd look that up. That's interesting. But that point aside, the reality of it being a real thing is undeniable, right? Which So it's interesting that we don't talk about that. And the, the point you're making is that it's provable. There's been science around this, that it does have a clear effect on that pineal gland. The question is what that does. What does your pineal gland do? We act like it's this, you know, like your, um, uh, what's the other one? We don't, uh, your, um, the tonsils, the thing that we just like, it's like, oh, it's from some other tonsils, time in our history. There's, we don't spleen, use. there's your appendix. There's right, a whole bunch it, of things that we're like, I don't know what that does. Just get rid of it. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's taking up room. <laughs> but it clearly does. We've got oh, now uh, if your spleen and things like this, like it goes forward and in, in, I think it was more so the tonsils, but there's, we're now realizing that they do have a, you know, things that they do. We acted like it was some archaic organ that we don't use anymore. So the point is that's still in that same conversation. And the question is, what does that do for the pineal gland? Well, the conversation is around the, the, what's the best way to put it? Uh, Met, it's not metaphysical, like, you know, like the, in, the, the, not the physical, but the internal, like your mind being able to, What's the right word for it? I don't know my blanking on this. Introspective, uh, like meditation, things like that. You know, that's yep. this is what it's about. That kind of it almost sounds like you're, we're going for like a secular version of spiritual. Well, but it was spirituals. That's why I was trying to look for the right word, like a scientific word, because spirituals. It, that's a, that's the way people who like, and I would agree with that. But from a person who was like a religious or spiritual person, that's how you would kind of connect the way that would make sense. But from someone who doesn't think of that stuff at all i'm trying to think of the right term for it it just basically means like the way you can like your imagination and you know the way that you can like internally think as opposed to just doing math right like it's a mad that kind of stuff and the point is that this that has a direct effect on the way that that operates and so people would argue that it's about your ability to like your third eye kind of conversation your ability to to see things that aren't there and this is where you get the mainstream scientific field to go you guys are ridiculous right but i think we all know this stuff exists like you can see auras used to be disregarded as you're a complete loon hippie but they're real and we know that now like you have an energy aura that definitely is different and so the thing is that these things exist i think that is truly whether it's a byproduct or this was the design of why this is in your water it absolutely affects the way that you think in a deeper level it affects the, your ability to potentially tap into things that we don't realize are there I truly think that that's what that's really about. I think it's, you know, calcifying the pineal gland. And, you know, what's interesting is if you actually go into what the thing is itself, as I understand it, it even has what you would call, uh, I don't know if it was like the cornea point or some piece that you actually have in your eye that's in this thing in your, and now that doesn't mean that you can see from that thing, but the point is you can look up the science around it and find that it has the same kind of things that your eye have. And it's like, it's just, it's very, like they talk about it like the, the like the, um, the, lizard brain kind of conversation you know like right. the it had like a like a defunct pathway to the um, to the optic nerve that used to it looks like it used right. to be able to go there almost like you can see little like dried up lakes on the the moon if the moon's real right right Where they right. say but not, like but not the things that you can see but but it's like an internal eye like that's the so in, in, you know these are all you know people theorizing but isn't that fascinating like that's that's always blowing my mind about that and it's like why do we not talk about that like if the, if you guys if we're being told that's all conspiracy theory then well then what is it then then show us what we're where we're wrong and what it's like it's not even engaged and that usually is what people in our conversation you know we we go well, that's a big red flag like why don't we just don't talk about it it's like it's fascinating to me but you know it's it's we shouldn't blindly think 
<clears throat> that it means all the other stuff either. You know, we, we don't know, I would say, but I think it's fascinating that all these things over time and then, you know, fluoride as well or like the conversations of things they're putting in your air or your food that all these things kind of counteract. Like even like the endocrine disrupting chemicals, which are fucking everywhere today. These things have an effect on the way that your mind works, the way that your body operates. I mean, it's terrifying what's going on today, man. Like the more we know, it's just like, God, and it's been going on for 20, 30 years, glyphosate literally everywhere. You know, these things, these things, uh, Stephanie Seneff, PhD, did a real big, we had, I had a conversation with her and Denny Rancor about the, the COVID relation, right? But her conversation about how glyphosate, which by the way, if you don't know this, I mean, I'm sure you do, it's everywhere. I mean, it's in the skin, it's in, it's on, probably on your skin, it's in the clothes you're wearing, it's in the air you're breathing right now. I mean, there's studies that have shown this, it's everywhere. They did a test, um, all of European Parliament, like five, six years ago, I think it was more than that actually, they did urine and they all had glyphosate in the urine, every one of them. Every single organic wine in Napa Valley, every single craft beer in Germany, they've done these tests, all have glyphosate, which means they're not organic anymore, technically. It's everywhere. These things work together. Like with the, the COVID vaccine at the time is what we were talking about, the injection, but other things too, the endocrine disrupting chemicals. And glyphosate has this really alarming way that it synergistically works to basically destroy your body. Is that by design? Was it because they didn't care? It's hard, you know, I don't know. It's dangerous to think about. And I guess this, I, I'm the known for being a devil's advocate in a way. So I'm just curious if this sounds like a legit silver lining as a last nod on the, um, the, the Rockefeller kind of system, Rockefeller mm -hmm. medicine and pharmaceuticals. And one of the, the proposed ideas, and I guess I think of it in a way of like, not real, con like that wasn't real communism. You know how everyone's like, you can't criticize what happened in China and you can't criticize what happened in Russia because that wasn't real communism. So almost in a way, not real Rockefeller <laughs> medicine, but the one of the premises, as I understood it originally, that they used to sell the whole thing was that anyone could kind of say that they were just like a doctor and they could just have gone to school at like, you know, Ma and Pa uh, Incorporated and then become doctor whoever and then fly to the other or, you know, drive to their part of the country and set up shop. And now all of a sudden they're a doctor with no real standard knowledge of anything so if you were to go from um like hospital to hospital for example they would have doctors showing up that didn't know anything at all about what was going on in that particular region and so one of the original pitches was to standardize um certain types of fields for example like doctors mm -hmm. medicine hence rockefeller medicine so that if you went to school or you learned about medicine in new york and then you had to, to move to texas you would kind of carry somewhat of a standardized um, you know, like body of knowledge, the same way that public education is now standardized education. So if you send a and, fourth and, grader from Florida to California, like you kind of have an expectation of reading level, Matt, like, are they doing multiplication tables? Are they doing fractions? Like all these things are sort of, you know, like, um, like compartmentalized in a way. Mm -hmm. And that was pitched as a good thing. Is there any silver lining in that whatsoever versus well, mom, pa university? Well, how has that worked out for standardized schooling? I think we all know that that you know. I think we talking about this, America is, remains the greatest country yeah, on earth. Yeah, so we tell ourselves right. But the 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 standardized school system is you know that's one example. But I mean, I think the the point comes down to, you know, I don't like standardization. Nobody is the same. That's a stupid argument, in my opinion, in a general sense that we act like we're all we can all fit in one mold. I think that's the kind of mindset that is broke. I mean, you know, if you want to have any, a conversation about why you think communism is bad, I mean, there's the, that's one of these kind of same concepts is how it's all just about normalization. Everyone is the same. We're all, you know, adhering to the same things, at the same stuff. Now, I, my conversation is I think all government is bad. No verse, no different than democracy to me, guys, if we realize how it all centralizes power. But the point for me is freedom always err on the side of more of freedom, self-determination, and choice. Always. Always, always, with all the different possible uh, consequences of that. I think that is the only real choice. And my point is, if you take this under the idea that, okay, it's a logical point. If we argue that we want this to be standardized, <clears throat> that we want it to be the same anywhere you go, it's about convenience on one hand, which I get. You know, so you, you never have to worry about it being different. You can go to one. Yeah, if you have Starbucks, to move, McDonald's. You know, you, Right. If you have to move to Texas because of a job, you're going to get the same medical treatment. Like that's the small point, but convenience or, or just standardization. Then you got the idea that, well, what about the first bad doctors? And I don't know. And, you know, I have to go there and that guy may give me bad treatment. And I don't know. So, well, all, what is that all really saying? You, it's about trust. I want to err on the side of self-responsibility. 
I am taking responsibility for my body. And if I'm going to go to a hospital, I'm going to research the hospital. I'm going to research the doctors. I'm going to find out the treatment I'm going to take. And I'm going to look into what other people may say about it. And I'm going to go to different ones. Remember when we used to pretend that getting a second opinion was the way medicine worked? <laughs> well, right? Does this include when you just got like shot and you might be dying and it's like, do we go to hospital A, B, or C? Uh, and you don't have the time to sit there and research. Would that would that give any credence to having like the well, standardization? You could always find an extreme example about why this. You know, it, but I, I still argue it's the same thing. It's 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 it is the old that that comes down to the people that are helping that person, making responsible choices about when. Of course, things can go wrong. It, look, are we pretending like in this current? And I know you're just playing devil's advocate, but are we in this circumstance? Are we pretending like there's no problems that arise because of the system? That it's. I mean, it is a fuck. It's a dumpster fire. Our medical system is a joke. We the third. I think it used to be third leading cause of death. I'm pretty sure it's one or two at this point in this country <laughs> is medical treatment, guys. I mean, obviously it's number practice. one. We're really truly acknowledging the the injection, right? It's the number one leading cause of death in the effing world at this point. So that's crazy. And so that, again, the point is coming back to what you said. Obviously, you could argue that you know, in in an extreme circumstance, it would be not. It would be safer to know that you have the same treatment, assuming that then same treatment that they agree on without your decision-making is even the best treatment. But you see this, how that can work. <clears throat> but taking it back to the most logical thing, that it, there will be danger, there will be consequences of erring on the side of freedom and self-determination. That's just, it's, it's, that's the way it works. You take that because this is what's most important. But going back to that overall point, it comes down to the fact that we need to take responsibility for these choices. And so then you allow the free market to exist. Right. So people can start up hospitals. And of course, there's other regulations and laws in place. You can't just open a, a, you know, a coffee hut in the corner and start selling whatever, you know, I'll give you surgeries from the corner. Like there's there's laws in place in that sense. But my point is that you have a doctor who has, you know, whatever you would go like, let's just say pre Rockefeller medicine time frame, specifically what we're talking about, the Flexner report. A, the American Medical Association, when they essentially just broad stroked and said, only these doctors are good and only these schools are allowed and everything else is now illegitimate, which that destroyed all the homeopathy. I mean, everything, which I would argue in some cases, yeah, there's probably people selling their poultices and whatever else that had real no, no effect. They thought it did. And it was more, you know, I'm sure that existed. But the point is, that if you remove, for, once you force yourself into this controlled system, obviously we're seeing how that, abu that abuse can take place. But hold on, I was going back to my point about, um, so the choice and ultimately that you it's the responsibility is on you to be able to choose those things or the free market, right? So you allow a situation where these hospitals within the, that's what I was saying. So pre flexion report. Well, yeah, I'm saying like we're, we're describing pre Rockefeller medicine, but, yeah, but well, hold on, hold on. Let me just finish. I, 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 I forgot it for a second. Let me finish my point. So the point is the flexor flexor and AMA point. So pre that, so you still have laws in place, but there's no like structuralized, like you have to be in this angle. So you have that kind of system. And so a doctor in a hospital opens up a little location, right? And maybe they don't, they think they know what they're doing within the system that's set up, but they're bad or they're hurting people. Well, how short do you think it would be between the opening and where people just start going, this guy's crazy. Let's go to the other hospital because there's a free market and they're everywhere. Right. And so this person, that's how that wor works without the government involved, would just slowly no longer have any business and people that got hurt, they could take action towards him. And this person would probably get sued. It would be gone. Right. And so that the illusion that somehow that we need to allow them to control every aspect of it, which means usually they give us this broken system after all these years today, in just because of that one hypothetical circumstance where that guy might get hurt. So we have to, you know, it's the, it's the mindset of all safe or none are safe and that's crazy and it doesn't apply. Right. So I think it's very obvious that we need to accept that there's always going to be risk in any circumstance that you take that responsibility. And that my opinion is the government really overall really adds more risk to your life in every possible way. I think we're watching that, you know, sorry. So go ahead. What were we going to say? Well, yeah, we, you were just describing that pre-Rockefeller uh, medicine system, right? And that kind of mm -hmm. sounds like the default that we're talking about, where it's like free to decide, take all the losses right. and risks with that. Although, I guess, based on my Rockefeller-based education that's informed me everything I know about the Rockefeller medicine system, that the whole reason that that was even able to be ushered in is because there were so many deficiencies that it was an easy sell to say, hey, like, are you sick of drinking chamomile tea if you've got like an ulcer? If so, like here's a, a way to kind of er eradicate people that are using just straight up homeopathy or Ma and Pa University. Again, as a devil's advocate yeah. angle for that, but it, it seems mm -hmm. like that's 
what was um, like the general sentiment that allowed the Rockefeller system to get ushered in was, was a response to that problem. It wasn't a hypothetical. It was big enough that people were like, yeah, let's try something radically different. Do we know that was the truth? I'm not disagreeing. Based on my Rockefeller really. education, absolutely. <laughs> right, right. No, exactly. And so like, I, I think it's, and I, I, do, I do value what you're doing. I think it's always important to, you know, even just from like a, procedural debate kind of position just oh, take you know taking the other side of the argument to like see that's always it's, it's valuable and very few people do that i think it's an important thing to to be able to put yourself on the other side of the conversation and consider that you know but i think that i i think that's always first and foremost important do we even know that's true you know like historically we always rely on these histories written by the winning hand right so Rockefeller clearly won out in the situation. So they're influencing the medical textbooks. They're influencing the, the school textbook. And that's not a, that's, that's a provable reality. Right. And so we have to consider that, but let's just say hypothetically, that was the truth. I, for, there's, it, there's self, self responsibility at that point. Right. So you're the one deciding what you want to do. You have family. Like I, my gut would tell me that's probably not even actually the real picture that there were some people that didn't know. And they were listening to the wrong people. Like, like my point is, you can go back through family tradition. You can go back to things like traditional Chinese medicine and show that these things are wildly medicinal. Like the, the, the they're efficacious, and you could show that. Like things like the, the the herbs and the different, even like a cannabis conversation. As much as they still pretend like that's not true, it's unbelievably clear that the medicinal purposes of cannabis are wildly efficacious, and in many cases, ten times better than the stuff they're giving people right now. You know, we just disregard it. But you know, I think that the the point comes down to at that time people would have been leaning more on what they were taught from their family and other doctors they may have known. And if there was a deficiency, my, I guess just why wouldn't they be trying to utilize some other thing? Like, why wouldn't they then go, okay, well, this isn't working. We go somewhere else. I think that the, the line that the government would say that you guys don't know what you're doing, so we have to normalize this for you, that just feels like an, uh, we see that happening today. And look behind it, they're lying to us. So, I mean, I, I, my point is I can't, I don't know for sure. And I, I would always err on the side of freedom and self personal choice. That's always where I'm going to line up. But I would tell, I, I'm willing to bet that was a manip, a, a well-planned manipulation because at that time they were talking, this was at the time when they were, you know, breaking up of standard oil and the conversation of how, you know, that was a choice as well to kind of manipulate the people into thinking they had won when all it really did was give them more power than they have ever had. And then you kind of, you see this shift into all these different fields, like the medical system got overtaken, you know, they took over all the medical colleges, they put the people on the boards of all the schools, you know, and so it's like, this was a complete regime change, right? I mean, that's really what it was. So I just don't know why we would believe what the premise for that regime change was, you know, but you know, who knows ultimately. You made a, you make a really good point too, that no two people are the same. So a lot of that, like standardized everything, education, medicine, uh, it's great in theory, but because if you just took two people on like a random sampling, you couldn't expect both of them to react the same way to foods, let alone drugs and all sorts of other and you, and you also make a really good point of uh, sort of erring towards freedom of choice overall if it comes down yeah. to sort of a decision. I think that's a really great litmus test or just like if, if you have to flip a coin, maybe it's better to just say like which one of these options gives more personal freedom versus the other one. Now, and I got I and go, well, I was, well, was going to say uh, this isn't all um, um, devil's advocate, but I, one one last that combines those two in a, in a small way. Could those two approaches, everyone's different err on the side of personal freedom, could that be construed as like pro-antidepressant, pro-SSRI? Well, no. I mean, that's the whole point because you're just giving everyone the exact same thing under the guise that that all treats the... Just because you're unhappy, you're feel, you're feel the problem is the same as this person who was unhappy. Well, that's pretty ridiculous. And it's not even unhappy, right? It's like desperately depressed. I mean, there's so much going on in the world that leads to that. Not, not even talking about like propaganda and conflicting narratives and like social engineering and like this thing that is causing schisms in people's brains. Like, so see, like Caitlin Johnstone's talked about that, but then you add all the different things they're giving them that adds more problems to that, all the different medications. You know, it's, I think absolutely not. I think it's clear that that is the opposite of what we should be doing. It's like, it's counterintuitive to the idea of being different, you know? But I mean, you could, it, it's not to say that, you know, if the, everyone is going to be different and would probably benefit from personalized medicine. And, but then, so I guess the better question to kind of the same way you were going was, could you then argue that that's the same thing they're saying about personalized vaccination, right? That's the direction they're going right now about the platforms and making it personalized to you. And it's like, well, that's not the same thing I'm saying, right? The, the, that is 
like Frankenstein mad science as far as I'm well, opinion. We've already got a little bit of that because when the, the original vaccines came out, I distinctly remember some people almost acting like they were better than thou because they got the Pfizer or the Johnson and Johnson, mm-hmm. the Moderna and not like the, like the rinky. I can't remember. Like one of them was like not as good as the others because that company was known for, and it, it just felt like there's a, like a pay less version of like pay less vaccine store instead of going to like fifth <laughs> Avenue to get your vaccine. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, probably. I mean, well, I mean, it was like, I, you know, AstraZeneca and then there was the, uh, yeah, what was the other one? I forget now. But yeah, I mean, it was funny to me was that those ones were, I said, right out of the gate, it was obvious to me that Moderna and Pfizer, which is exactly what happened, were going to be the ones they went with. One, because they were clearly leaning into the platform, which was the plan. And that's now later come out that they did that because they wanted that. They knew it was less seen, less fleshed out and less likely to be successful, but they knew they wanted the mRNA platform to be the direction, so they just put all their eggs in that basket and killed a lot of people doing so. I don't even think it was an accident, quite frankly, but that's wild that that's become a reality that nobody in the media has talked about, but that's been admitted publicly, right? There's been different points, but that those two were going to succeed also because they were invested in them. Shocking. Fauci and everybody else had literal financial investments in the companies that ultimately succeeded. You know, but I think AstraZeneca was kind of regarded early as, oh, this one's the more dangerous. And it's like, that's ridiculously false. It's They're all really dangerous. But the problem is one has spike protein and all the dangerous bat, you know, things. The other one has that. And then it's got mRNA, lipid nanoparticles, and all, the, you know, all these other things, d- extra DNA manipulation, protein folding. You know, it's like all these crazy things. It's like, that's just, I can't, I can't believe how crazy that whole conversation actually is. And it's still barely being talked about in the, in the corporate media. Well, that's only if you even care or halfway understand what all those acronyms means. But from like a regular layman, there was also a separate debate and a separate choice going on in the, in the real world. And that was like, do I want mine with a side of fries or do I want one with a free donut or do I want mine with like, right. And and I'm not even kidding. That was, that was actually ways of like, Oh no, like I got the, the Dunkin' Donuts vaccine or I got the Chris, it was a Krispy Kreme. Sorry. I don't want to spread this information. I got the Krispy Kreme (laughs) vaccine. And then someone's like, well, I got the Tim Horton vaccine. That one came with like free cheese on my fries. And I kind of think that that might be the next, like, what if there is like an exclusive Air Jordans that come out, but you can only get or like like maybe not Yeezys, but you can only get those new Nikes if you get the vaccine. So now it's like an extra status symbol, but it also it's like the flyest kicks you've ever seen. Yeah, it would surprise me. I mean, like it, not the same as the as the injection, but the you know Worldcoin, the uh, uh, Sam Holt, uh, Sam Altman, and the whole cryptocurrency thing. Well, it's it's a it's like a. Fed coin style thing, like directly from the the the, the establishment. You They're know, actually the main it, sponsor of the show. Just just be careful. Oh, sorry. What? Worldcoin is the main sponsor of this show. Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I should, you asked me not to say it. <laughs> oh, you can. You can. I might just edit this out. <laughs> Feel free. Say, Feel free. The, the point is that they that they uh, did the thing where you scan the eyes to get the crypto, which I think is crazy and very alarming. Right. The idea that here, give me your retina scans to be able to get this crypto. Well, that's Demolition so Man. I see it as the same thing. What's that? I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Demolition Man. That's exactly the premise in Demolition Man. And they, oh, they unfreeze yeah. a villain uh, who is um, Simon Phoenix, played by Wesley Snipes. And the the he figures it out within a second. He takes a pen and he stabs the doctor's eye out and he uses the yeah, doctor's right. retina, which it's I kind of it's interesting because now there is an incentive that didn't exist before to remove somebody's eyeball. Like at no point in history uh, that I'm aware of, was there ever like an actual legal or medical incentive to like rip someone's eye and use it? And now well, with retina scans and this stuff, like now there's an actual reason you might be walking around with one eye because someone's trying to mug you. Or maybe just like like organ theft. That happens too, right? <laughs> but but yeah, but I think my point was just about the overlap to the idea of incentivizing you to get something that is, uh, it's, you know, he, he, the, like here's some fries and you get this wildly dangerous body altering injection. It's like, it's just like to not realize how crazy that is. And that's, I think I see the same thing. Take here. Here's my biometric data. And here, you know, here's a dollar. It's just like, you guys are being screwed, man. It's like that. That's the, it's, it's about collecting and manipulating. And I think all of that, I think the, the injection part of it was, I don't know why anybody ever fell for that. And I just wonder, I mean, I, I like to believe it's not the majority. Because that would make me really depressed to think that the majority of people are that pliable to just, you know, what's his name from New York jamming fries down his mouth while he's eating on that press conference. You know, it's like, it just, it's, it, it was weird. Even for people that were on the side of the injection, they, they acknowledged that's just weird. Here's a cheeseburger, get a vaccine. Like, 
it just felt wrong. And it, it still does. I think everybody's recognizing that. Even the people that took it are not taking the newer ones. So this far, most of them anyway. I mean, uh, let's let's get depressed for a second because I kind of do think that it's been the majority. And this is not like a look down on your nose at like these stupid sheeple way, but it's a more of like a generational thing where the new generations don't realize how weird it is because it's already been normalized before they even form their first original thought. And I, I worked at Disney for 10 years. And while I was in there, there was a couple programs that we had been working on where like kids would sign up and register. And there's all this information. And I remember like, it was a huge corporate conference. And I, I was always the idiot that like asks the question that you're not supposed to ask in a public <laughs> setting. And I just remember asking like, is that, is this a concern at all? Even legally, about like figuring out like this kid's favorite color, food, like everything. Like, can't you use this to identify a specific person and almost, you know, like um, victimize them in all mm. sorts of ways because there's like child protection laws online. And the response, again, in a public setting, it kind of blew my mind, changed my whole mind on this thing. And he was like, yeah, yeah, that's only if you require it for sign up. If like after sign up, if you ask someone like what their preferences are so that you can like more custom tailor their content, that's completely on because now it's like an optional opt in. And the other point to this was that the the lie here is that, oh, well, if I tell, you know, McDonald's like what my favorite song is and my favorite color and all this in some point in the future, like they're going to make me the my perfect burger that's got like all my favorite everything. They'll make me a Happy Meal toy that's all of my favorite. But what really they do is they just figure out what the aggregate is and make that and push it on you. It's almost like that Rockefeller standardized system. But, totally. but the lie has always been and continues to be even now with like AI is like, oh, just give us all your information. Let us scan your contacts. Let us read all your emails and we'll find out what you like and we'll make sure that you only see the things that you like and we'll hide the things you don't like. And none of that ever actually materializes. Right. Well, or, or the real point is, oh, and surprise, we've been doing that for, for 10 years. <laughs> you know, we're just, we're just pretending we're asking your permission now, you know? Right, but, right. But you make a great point about that, right? Is that, is it, is it that they produce what you ultimately wanted like because they use your data to you know uh, to create something that was exactly for you or did they spend the next year social engineering you to end up wanting the thing that they create for everybody you know that, and i think dude, that was the feedback point. loop that's where yeah. they tested at the end of their feedback loop is to right, find out right. they're working mm. i think it's exactly that and i think it's happening in everything we do politics i mean you know these we it's like we just you know it, like it fell on deaf ears when the founders of Facebook and people started speaking up going like, we've, we destroyed the world. <laughs> like period end of conversation. Like, you know, like literally just like, what did we do? Like, I don't let my children use these apps, like the creators of this stuff, you know? And we just, it just went past it. And I mean, I, I don't know how you could have ever like decoupled us from social media at that point, because some people would have used it, you know, you know, but that we just know that we're being engineered. Like we know that we're, especially right now. And that's my point with the new Twitter, which is just, to me, way more alarming than it ever was, even though there seems to be at least a little bit less blunt censorship. There's still a yeah, lot of but it. You're talking about based meme Twitter where you can be a little bit racist now without being afraid of it, right? Or just that they don't censor. Like I, I think they're, they're still clear, blunt censorship. Maybe a little bit less, but maybe I'm just not seeing it all. But it's much more tailored towards the engineering, the, the quiet suppression, you know, where you're not even realizing you're being throttled. No one can seize you, which also happened before, but it's mm -hmm. real heavy in that way. And I think right now it's, you know, like the times where you see it, where they go, oh, well, this was wrong. You have to delete it before you can come back. And it's like, well, why don't you, if it's wrong, then why, why then just remove it and, and hit me. Or like, it's, it's about training you. No, 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 no. You're not allowed to say that. Now you take the action and then we'll let you back in the room. You know, and it's, it's really crazy. And that's just a real simple, obvious example. We need to stand back and think about like, like I was saying, it's not just about tailoring these things to where you see the tweets that you like to see. Like I'm talking about like a different specific Twitter in general for e for individuals or maybe even just different groupings like algorithmically grouped into here so you're seeing this version of Twitter where other things just don't you know and it's it's alarming to me how it's very easy to see and it, we're all being engineered you know and it's like we're being trained to see like like we're being trained to want the toy they're about to produce let's put it that way well they That's know scary. better than us because they've because they've got a higher view from their ivory towers. Why wouldn't I got to give it to you? And and I want to be mindful of your time. I've got a segment that we have to do. Otherwise, all my Patreons will leave immediately. So we're going to get <laughs> right into it now. Hey, conspiracy buffs! I double dare you to take some PCP, the paranormal conspiracy probe. On your marks, get set, and go. 
Nice. Okay, first question. Are you a cop? Because if you're a cop, you have to tell me right now. Because <laughs> you know that's not a real thing. No, I'm not a cop. That's but what you, cops quick, all say. You know what's funny? Uh, that I, I used to have a segment just like this. Right, the first radio show I ever did, which was also video, we had a thing called Conspiracy Crossfire. I love this. It's one of my favorite things, man. Go ahead. So here, here's the rules. It's just going to be a one in, one to ten rating system. I mentioned a conspiracy or a topic. One yeah. means you don't believe it. Ten means you do. Five is you're on the fence, open minded. All right. Got it. Uh-huh. First one, we're going to start out easy and we'll go a little bit difficult. Bigfoot, one to ten. One to ten, Bigfoot. Well, see, this is hard because I want to explain things too. But I just on a basic sense, I'd probably say like nine or ten because I do think that there's something something that's you know whether it's a bigfoot that we understand or just like some creature that we you know i do think there's something things like that out there so i'd probably put it pretty high okay i can i can be more specific too so that we don't have to leave as much open for for example um a human being has stepped foot on the moon in the last 100 years Ooh, that's an interesting one so i i would say my mindset on that and see i'm always going to explain these things because it's there's there's always caveats to this i've always said the same thing that i think that that when they did that, like the original conversation, the videos and the fake phone call, I think we can literally prove that was fake. I, I don't even know why anybody debates that. The idea that you could do a fucking immediate direct phone call from the moon. We can't do that. There today, was a two right? minute delay. Come on. There was a two minute it's, delay. Uh, it's, it's so fake, right? But the point, there's a thousand things you could prove that. Now, I said for sure that at that time, I still don't think that means that that's not possible. I think that was about the, the space race. I think it was about lying about that. Now, the question for me is whether that's ever truly happened. I would argue, though, that I do think that there's the scientific uh, capability to be able to go into space. And then the question is, if there are moons and things we're told out there, which I don't know how we all I think, yes, is my point. But there's a lot of caveats. I think that the lie is real about what happened. And I think we also know that there's so many things. But I think that the technology is real. And I do argue that there is a planetary system. I don't think that there's a flat Earth or that there's no space and so on. So what was the question? Is there... So well, all, the question is step on the moon. It has a human being stepped foot on the moon, not theoretical, would, but practical. I would say a five because I don't I don't know how I can prove that, but I would say is it possible? I would put a 10. Let's put it that way. So and you are you already uh read ahead a little bit on the test, but I was gonna say flat earth is up next one to ten. And I realize how vague that is. So you can no no, that's that's an away. easy one for me. I would say one. I would say I think in my opinion. It's low on the scale because I don't think the evidence that's presented, and trust me, for all, every time I say that, people go, oh, you, then you haven't seen the thing that I know. It's like, I, trust me, I have gone, the, the show I did back then, I'm sure there's new stuff that's even come up. I, I went, I, I studied this for, for, for a very long time and I went through the different things. You know, I talked about all the bigger discussions that people usually put forward. I talked about the, you know, all the mathematical conversations and, and I, my mindset is there's definitely something strange. Like I, I still circle around the weirdness around Antarctica, you know, the Admiral Byrd and the whole conversation of the last, you know, all the, and the lack, like the, in, in like the, the air, the flights and the different things. There's so many anomalies that I just can't explain. So does that then translate? The Earth is flat. I don't think that's the connection. It could. Who knows? But I think the what it shows to me is that there's something be, being covered up there. What it ultimately is, but I think the evidence doesn't connect it. So I would go lower. You know, one, two, three, something like that. What about Hollow Earth? One to ten. You know, I haven't. Th- that's one that I haven't had enough research on to be able to really say. But if I had to just give it a number, I would a likelihood. I'd probably be in the middle somewhere because I think that it's certainly a possibility. Like even scientifically, I think that you could argue that there's something. There's a interesting way that that could be possible but i don't know i haven't studied enough to say we passed that so i'd probably just say five because that i'm not sure uh one to ten in the year 2024 current current times freemasons run the world no nah, I, I think i so today that i don't I, I think the question about whether that was ever an all-encompassing run the world conversation i think that's a little bit too oversimplified but today i would argue still probably no on the lower end but do groups like that have very clear influence over policy, governments, and all of that, I would say 10, 100%. But whether it's all or nothing, I've never think that's the case. But does happen, like just looking at groups that we could talk about behind the scenes, there's no question, man. 100% influence highest levels of power. That's the groupings we talk about. It's very real. Uh, demons 1 to 10. Demons, now that's a difficult one because there's a and lot of... And not just like connection. addicted to alcohol, like a legit, like... like yeah, I know what you mean, like an actual, like supernatural concept. But I... What, Exorcist, yeah. Yeah, but see, that's hard because there's a lot of, you know, if you're a Christian, that means something. If you're not, it does, you know, there's different. So I, if you're just going to say supernatural entities, I'm 100%. I, so I, I mean, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I mean, I'm a Christian. So I, doesn't, I, I believe in the idea of 
you know, Christian concepts, which then opens the door for things like that. But I, I would say just from like a scientific perspective, I think you can prove that there's anomalies when it comes to like afterlife and different things. And that would then open the door clearly to the idea of uh, whatever. Again, that's where it would be like, whether that's somebody who's hasn't, pa you know, passed into whatever we see as the afterlife and they're like angry about that, or it's like an, like a haunting kind of concept, you know? So I would put it in the higher levels of the numbers, probably maybe like a eight or nine, something like that. I, I definitely think so. Uh, bi so biblically, talking snakes one to ten, as in like a human talked to a snake at some point in history. Oh, so like directly, so like bi the Bible story being true. I don't think so. I think those are metaphors. I think that's a. I think that's a completely metaphors. But again, how the hell would we know? <laughs> so uh, here's another one, a little nuanced. One to ten, that if I went onto Amazon right now and I bought the top, like the top three. How to Summon a Demon for Dummies books, which I'm sure exist. If they don't, I'll, I'll have to make one. But if you bought the top three that had all the legit reviews, one to ten that you could summon a demon that weekend. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> I don't think. I don't think. I don't think. First of all, that I, you know, if, if that's whether that's even first of all something that someone can do. I have no idea. I'm not somebody that's researched that stuff. But my point would be that if that was going to be something that's real, I'm just trying to be logical about it. I highly doubt somebody could order a book and have the intent to be able to make that happen over the weekend. It's I imagine that would be something that you would need to understand, you know, who knows, you know, but I, but that's something that I would say probably not. Well, so I'm, I'm just thinking like an over. idiot savant or some, something, someone can just can like <laughs> yeah. whip through it, memorize all of it. But it's the book um, thing that changes for me. Like, so if we're going to say, is that possible again, I would put it in the middle because I, I've never even researched that. I don't know, but I would argue I'm the mindset. I'm up. Uh, it's, everything's possible, right? I'm sorry, I put it in the middle, but if somebody could order the book and do it over the weekend, I would put that zero. <laughs> so I think it doesn't make sense. Okay, and then um, last one, one to 10, spirit cooking is real magic. Well, that's, again, so you're talking about spirit cooking, meaning Abramovich. Marina Abramovich, right. and some and, people and, claim it's art installations, some people well, so claim... what but, do you mean by real magic? And see, I'm probably irritating people, but I mean, it's important to me to be... No, it's to, good. Like, I, I like to be specific. I like to yeah. leave it open at first and I'm happy to always be more specific. So to be specific, when she has celebrities and politicians and like these huge events where, you know, you cut your left hand and eat the pain and all this stuff, Wait, there's so. sort of like the, the two polarized approaches are it's just all edgelord art installations to make people feel creative. And then the other side is like, they are literally doing sacrifices to the right. God ball and Moloch and they're eating people's faces and it's because they want to live forever and have superpowers. Okay, so the, then removing the word magic because that's that it depends on what we think that is or what we're talking about. You're asking whether they're doing rituals or they're doing art. That's an easier way to frame that if that's what you're right. saying. Well, do they would... believe that it's magic or do they think okay, that it's that's, art? That's easier because that's that's what I always say about this stuff in general. Whether you believe it or not, it matters whether we think they believe it. And I think that the it, I think it's very clear that there's a ritualistic aspect to this. I think that's beyond question. You know, I they, I think the whole art game is. Like there's people that produce art, and I think a lot of the modern stuff that's done today is just laughably stupid. And they all just oh, look at this you know, like I saw this one where they had like buckets that were filled with sand. The guy like unplugged the bottom bucket and it let the sand fall out, and eventually the whole thing fell over. And they were like, oh yay! And it's like, what was that like a kindergarten person? Like it was just stupidest thing in the world. They all like thought <laughs> that, it was the that was fifty thing. million dollars, by the way. <laughs> exactly. It's like so. It's just so stupid. So, but I, but I, my point is that that there's that stupid stuff, and there is very clearly like a weird overlap that they talk about it's like an artistic expression and even then you, there's probably people that think that's what that is i think what she's doing is very clearly ritualistic i, I, I just so many layers to it you just can't deny that. that that's what i would say so if you're again to your so i would maybe like a nine without knowing for sure uh, and I, i'll sneak one last one in um mm -hmm. the octopus murders danny costalero one to ten um do you know what i'm talking about they just no. had a new they they just had a whole new uh, Netflix documentary, but it's also based on a oh. book of this guy that was found in a bathtub. And oh, okay, let me let me swap it in for an, another one that you might have heard of. Okay. Uh, Oklahoma City was entirely done by Timothy McVeigh, Lone Wolf, one to ten. <laughs> Zero. I don't. That's. I think it's obvious. <laughs> I mean, if okay. you, you want to look into like James Corbett's work on that and stuff, I mean, these things are obvious manipulations. You know, there, there's so many patsies over the years that we can prove, I mean, like literally 100% prove. And we just, you know, just go forward with these stories, you know? So it's just sad that I'm sure your audience knows well about all this stuff, you know, but I, I love this whole dynamic. You know, what's funny to me is that 
I've never shied away from, I love, I actually really enjoy talking about things that are completely unprovable. Just like the idea, even though I'm pretty much always going to end on something where I'm just like, well, we don't know, you know, but here's my thoughts about it. I still enjoy talking about things like this. And nonetheless, there'll be people that will take it happily, you know, be like, oh, he believes this. That means doubt everything else he said. It's like, and my point is like, nobody should be afraid of stuff like that. There's always going to be people like that. They're going to try to go after you because you're a, you're willing to entertain or discuss things that they think are off limits. That's that's them showing their stupidity, right? I should, shouldn't point myself on. I say that's them <laughs> showing their stupidity. <laughs> you know, because that's the truth. They, that means they're afraid. They've been Why did you just point at me? You just pointed at me when you did that. that like, time. Oh, you're right. Because I was doing it this way. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's over here. <laughs> that way. That, those guys. But yeah, but I, I'm, I, it's, it's enjoyable, but I also think it's important. You know, we should be able to have conversations about things that are, you know, like even to take it to a real extreme level, you know, like, like, like things like the Holocaust, you know, it's like there, there's, we should 100% be able to go, well, is it, is it, is it, is there anything, is there evidence to suggest that they lied about this or that could have been fake? Why is that? Uh, you know, it's, it's because there's been this thing built around it to add, you know, to, to, to tell you that you're not allowed to talk about it, which that should be the most alarming reality. Anything should be able to be entertained and discussed and criticized. Of course, you know, and that's not to say that I'm even saying, I think it's fake, but it's just the idea that it's amazing to me that there are people out there that box themselves out of entire conversations because some nebulous authority said so you know it's just like that's that's embarrassing you should be embarrassed by that <laughs> a, a fun one can be what if it's seven million are you allowed to ask if it's seven million or is that like you can know you go up a number or is it only if you go down a number it becomes problematic well that's a, that's actually an excellent point right because both would be ar arguing that that they're incorrect right, right. it's only <laughs> when you're undermining that it happened is the people which again you know i i get the argument from from somebody who may just feel insulted by it that well that that's insulting well, okay then you can be insulted that's i think i lot, just committed right? a felony in germany by saying that too not even yeah, kidding it, yeah dude there's crazy stuff i was just seeing a video today um i think it was maybe a couple weeks ago but he was talking about how in britain there oh it was comparing to russia saying that in russia there was like 300 some of the people that were arrested for things they posted online. The guy was like, oh, of course, that makes perfect sense, you know? And then they go, but you know how many people were arrested in Britain in that same time frame? Like 3,000 or whatever the number was. And the guy's like, what? <laughs> no. It's like, well, yeah. And we just have this weird impression of like the dare, you know, that's not to say one's good, bad. It's just that we, you know, it's amazing the blinders we put on in these, you know, the Western civilized societies and rules based international order while we, they, they break the rules everywhere they go. Just sad, you know, but I'm sure your audience is well aware of that. <laughs> So, uh, Ryan Christian, we're leaving a lot on the table here. A great conversation. One of my favorites is when people ask to like clarify a question or like, oh, hold on, let's break this down. Like, that's, that's my gold, man. Like, I love going into the, the weeds on that. So, we'll have to do this again, get into yeah. lots of other topics. Um, again, Last American Vagabond, uh, shout out where people can find you and, you know, whatever schedule you got going on, any projects, anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at the moment, <clears throat> excuse me um just because of what's going on with the uh the different attacks that we're under that that we've there's less projects than usual but you know the article's still coming my show's still happening we're you know right now it's pretty consistently about four or five days a week if not more um and that's you know that includes interviews and all sorts of other things the last american vagabond.com is always the best as i say on every show it's don't let them be the conduit between you and our information same with what you have going on. Go to paranoidamerica.com, right? Go there first. Check in with the information and then, you know, go elsewhere, obviously. But, you know, if, like on YouTube or Grumble or wherever else, even Twitter, you know, they really want you to go there, which it's convenient. We just talked about this today, right? Convenience is, the, is, always, the, is always the way that they, they pull you in, you know, but you go there and then you could, I get it. You can go to all your channels and it's all right there on Twitter. The problem is that then you may not be seeing it all, may not post that day. Maybe something got cut out. That's happening, by the way. We're seeing that happen. Mainstream's already doing that, where suddenly they say something, you know, Israel did this, or they blindly sell the narrative. It turns out they lied about it. They just edit the little piece out. We're not allowed to do that. They let them do that. No change. Doesn't change the viewer account. They just cut the piece out where we don't get to see it, right? So there's so <laughs> much of that happening. It's just wild. So, but yeah, I, I think that uh, what you're doing here is, is very important. And I think that everybody should continue to support us at these main locations and continue to support independent media in general and uh, all of our links on our, our website are there for you to check out. So thanks for having me on, brother. I think this is a, a good medium. I like the I like the fun conversation. Thank you, man. And good luck on your, on your law calls and everything. And again, shout out to this show's sponsor, WorldCoin, and my aunt Marina Abramovic. Uh, her book that came out just passed, I think like 2 million sold. Um, congratulations, Aunt Marina. 
So if you want to say anything to my aunt, Ryan, go ahead now. Otherwise, we'll close this out. Well, I don't know if you're being kidding or not. So, but <laughs> I'm not sure. So <laughs> thanks for having me right. on, brother. That was a good show. Thank you guys. Bye. And all American stickers, cryptids, cults, and killers. killers. We got all your favorite conspiracies. All the best. And more on our sticker sheets. There are no American stickers. They'll make you smile and snicker. False flags and secret societies. All of these and more on our sticker sheets. Explore the unique with paranoid American sticker sheets. Unearth tales of cryptids, cults, and mysteries through each sticker. These won't last long. Get yours now at ParanoidAmerican.com. We love American stickers, cryptids, cults, and killers, killers. We got all your favorite conspiracies. All the data and more on our sticker sheets. Paranoid American stickers. They'll make you smile and snicker. What the heck are you waiting for? Discover the extraordinary with paranoid American sticker sheets. From cryptids in the night to cults out of sight, each sticker is a unique find. Get yours now at paranoidamerican.com. Scribble my life away, driven to write the page. Will it enlighten your brain? Give you the flight, my plane, paper the highs ablaze. Somewhat of an amazing feel when it's real, the real you will engage it. Your favorite, of course, the Lord of an arrangement. I gave you the proper results to hit the pavement. If they get emotional, hey, maybe your language, a game, how they playing it well without Lakers evade them. Whatever the cost, they are the shape shift. Snakes get decapitated, met is the apex. Execution of flame, you out. Nuclear bomb distributed at war. Rather gruesome for eyes to see. Max them out, then I light my trees. Blow it off in the face. You're despising me for what though? Calculated and rather cutthroat. Paranoid American must be all the blood smoke for real. Lord, give me a day away. Vacate. They wait around to hate whatever they say. Man, it's not in the least bit weak. Get heavy rotate when a beat hits. So thank us. You're welcome. Fuck the niggas for real. You're welcome. They ain't never had a deal. You're welcome, man, they lacking appeal. You're welcome, yet they doing it still. You're welcome.